encounter with Georgia Purdom, and she is a geneticist. Talk about that, please. Well, I have a PhD in molecular genetics. From Ohio State University. So basically my degree was in studying the cell, the DNA, all the parts that kind of make it work. And um, my specialty was in bone biology, so understanding how bones are sort of formed and remodeled um, in mammalian um, systems. And so uh, that's what my research focused on. So uh, bones, speaking of bones, um, have we ever found transitions from one kind of animal to another in, in the bones? No, we haven't really found that. I mean, if evolution was true, we would expect to find a lot of transitional fossils, um, organisms that were in the process of gaining things and becoming something new. And obviously, we don't see those. I mean, we do find interesting animals that have um, traits, maybe like a platypus or something like that, that have traits of several different um, animal types, but they're certainly not transitional from one thing to another. They're their own distinct kind. So no transition from one to another? No. All right, so um, have there ever been anything found that um, is in the, well, you already said that, it's not in the process. Um, so nothing can change from one type of animal to another type of animal. We don't see macro evolution, but we do see micro evolution. Right, and we, so we do see organisms, obviously, um, speciating. And so we have lots of different dog breeds today and different types of cats, but we don't have um, dogs making changes that will eventually evolve them into a cat. And one of the things about evolution I always say is, you know, they always say time is the key. Time is not the key. Okay, you can have all the time in the world, but if you don't have a genetic mechanism that allows you to add the information you need to go from one kind of organism to another, time is irrelevant. You know, you have to have that mechanism, and we know of no observable mechanism that allows organisms to do that. So an animal can't change from one kind of animal to another kind of animal. Yeah. But they do have small changes which might make them go from one type of species to another. But Noah didn't have to have species, did he? He had to have kinds. Right, right. He didn't have, and that's one of the claims that's often made against Noah's Ark. Well, how could he fit all those animals on the Ark? Well, because he didn't have to. Um, he only had to fit two of every kind. And in our modern classification system, um, kind is usually thought to be at about the family level. So genus and species are lower than that. So um, if you look at things like at the Creation Museum, we have a donkey and a horse, which are a cross between a zebra and a donkey and a zebra and a horse. So you have, they can breed with each other because they're of the same family or the same kind. Um, so only had to bring two of the horse kind on, okay. on board here. That makes sense. Come on, donkeys and zebras and horses, we didn't have to have all the different variations, but we just had to have Right, well, probably something that would have had um, the ability to have all of those traits that we see in a donkey and a zebra today. So we show representative horse kinds here on the ark. Um, so, but just two of them, because, you know, when you really look at it, I mean, every child, if they looked at a zebra, a horse, and a donkey, probably put them together. But they just look really similar. They have similar traits. It's just variations on those traits. And then that greatly reduces the number of animals no one had to have on the ark. Right, so we estimate about 1,400 kinds, or a little more than 1,400 kinds, and because you had to take two of some and seven, or we say seven pairs of some, that would, we estimate around 7,000 animals, but we're overestimating um, probably at that. We try to, like bats, for example. We have 18 different kinds of bats, you know, that we say were on the ark. Now, in reality, were there that many? We don't know, but, we tried to, because there's 18 families of bats, we said, okay, there's 18 kinds of bats. And so it's, like I say, we probably overestimated to give kind of a worst case scenario, but it's probably less than that that we did. So um, how many animals do you think total would you count? Two of every kind, but then seven of the total? Um, we would say seven, around 7,000. Yeah, 7,000 and maybe, probably less. So is there enough room here in this ark for them? Yeah, absolutely. So some people have said, well, why don't you have them all here? It's like, well, because we're trying to teach lots of things. Um, not just about the animals, but how Noah and his family lived, about things that happened after the flood, like the Ice Age, the Tower of Babel. So we're trying to teach some other things, too, especially here on the third deck. And we didn't, Noah didn't have to have massive restroom facilities and restaurants and, you know, all those things that we have, we have to have here um, that Noah didn't have to have. So Noah didn't have tourists. <laughs> no, Noah didn't have tourists. So, so stairs and you know AC systems and all of that takes a lot of space. That makes sense. So, um, so how does 
delay through creation rather than evolution. Well, I would say it definitely um, supports and confirms it because, again, like I was saying before, what we really observe is like mutations, for example. So that's necessary for evolution too, because you have to have those genetic changes to add the information you need. Let's say to go from dinosaurs to birds, you got to get that, right? So you got to get a way to change whatever's there into that. The problem is that's not what mutations do. Um, they typically take away the information, or they might alter it slightly, but it's never in a way that's going to change and give an organism a completely, I mean, like, brand new structure, brand new function, like along those lines of, you know, a dinosaur going to a bird. So you don't believe dinosaurs are alive with us today as birds? No, and, and you have to consider, too, it wouldn't just be one kind of change that has to happen, but there's just one thing that has to happen. I mean, you're talking about a coordinated set of things like hollow bones, um, the ability to fly. I mean, the muscles have to be attached in certain ways for that to happen. So you're talking a lot of things that would have to happen by random chance um, to allow one kind of organism to evolve. Well, the problem that you have is to Right, right, and that's the problem. Is mutations just don't do that. They take away. They might slightly older, like you might get a slightly different color. And so many times I see the claims like, oh, this is evolution in action. I'm like, no, it's not. It's variation in action, sure, speciation in action, but you're not you're not adding the types of things you need to go from one kind to another. So are uh, mutations beneficial? Um, under certain circumstances, they can be, but I always say it really depends on the environment. Because, for example, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, it is beneficial if those bacteria live in a hospital. But if they get transported out of the hospital, where there's lots of other bacteria to compete with them, they typically won't survive as well. Because they've had to give something up to be antibiotic resistant, and so it's not beneficial to them in another environment. So it depends, it's very context dependent, how beneficial the patient is. So the hand of the game is really a loss of information. Right, I mean, um, there are bacteria that, as they gain antibiotic resistance, like they might lose the ability to break down a certain nutrient or lose the ability to do something else, which in the environment they're in at that time, it's fine. But if they get, but overall, they haven't gained anything. They're not, they're just more fit for that environment than maybe less fit for another environment. My question is about that. What about that is Well, just like every other land, uh, land-dwelling, air-breathing animal, there were dinosaurs on the earth. Um, we estimate somewhere between about 60 and 90 kinds of dinosaurs um, that need to be represented on the earth. And, you know, a lot of people have this idea from Jurassic Park and things that all dinosaurs are like humongous, um, and they're not, you know. Some of them are very small. Uh, he didn't have to take adults, obviously. It would have made more sense to take juveniles that would be produced more after the flood. So, um, they were land animals. They were created on day six, and so God said to bring those and all the land animals, so they would have been all on the earth. So, how can my readers find out more about genetics and how to do the creation of the you can go to answersingenesis.org, and that is the organization that built the ARC. And if you even just search for Pergam, um, you'll find a lot of genetics articles um, that come up under my name, or search for genetics, and you'll find a lot of information there. Um, and that's where you get a lot of our, our resources, really. That's our sort of flagship resources. And then we definitely encourage them to visit the Creation Museum and the ARC encounter, and you can find out more at creationmuseum.org and ARC. Do you have any party thoughts for the yeah, I, um, I really encourage people to come out and see this because I have been here many times and every time I drive up to this structure, I'm just like blown away. Um, it's massive. It really is our, our tagline better than imagination. And that's so true. I don't know how to describe it in some ways. I'm like, you have to come see this. And the same happened for us. I, I saw it last year and I'm uh -huh. trying to explain to them what it looked like. Yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. And the only thing I could say is that it, you just have to see it. Right. And yeah. now she saw it and she's she's saying the same thing. Uh -huh. You just have to see it. <laughs> yes, we definitely encourage them to come. We've got special combo tickets now so people can visit both the Creation Museum and the Ark uh, for, I think, unlimited times that you want to come in for seven days at a very reasonable price. So we encourage you to check that out. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you.